Well, good evening, and welcome to Solid Rock Bible Church Sunday night Bible study. And uh, we are glad to be able to gather together here and study the Word of God. And it's been something of an eventful day um, here at the church. Um, and uh, in light of that, I just want to make sure that we reiterate to this, this to you, lock your car. Don't leave your keys in your car. Lock your car. Don't leave anything valuable because even though we have somebody out in the parking lot, things can happen very fast and as they did this morning. And um, so we just want to make sure that everybody is safe and your stuff is safe. But don't make it tempting. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a break-in to the building. And so, and then today, we had a break-in to a car, attempted theft of a car. Um, and as a result of that, the person did get keys to the building. The locks have all been changed now this afternoon. So if you have a key that used to fit this church, it will not work anymore. And you will be issued a code and you will punch the code in to a keypad outside and that will get you in. That way we don't have to make 120 copies of keys. So we it went to a, a keys system, I mean a, uh, a code system uh, outside this afternoon. So we, it's been kind of busy around here today. Anyway, we are here tonight to study the Word, and uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer. Should we do that? Sam, I need you to pray for us tonight. I probably need to pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight uh, we'll be guided by your Holy Spirit as our instructor, spiritual truth. Father, that we will learn and draw closer to you with deeper faith and trust. Father, with a clearer view of our mission. Thank you for each person that is here tonight, Father. Have your will done in, in each life, Father. They approach the word tonight. Thank you, Pastor Jerry, and his study. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are looking um, at uh, uh, Paul's defense before King Agrippa and Bernice. It's actually before Festus and King Agrippa and Bernice. And I wanted to just make a little note uh, of, of some, I think you have some things, notes in your handouts, maybe from last week or sometime. Who was King Agrippa and who was Bernice? <coughs> well, King Agrippa was Herod Agrippa II, and uh, he ruled from A.D. 27 until 92. He was the son of Herod Agrippa I, that's mentioned in Acts chapter 12. And he ruled over parts of Palestine from AD 53 until his death. Now his sister was Bernice, and she was widowed when her second husband, Herod, king of Chalcy, died in AD 48, and from that time on, she lived with her brother in an attempt to quiet rumors that there was an incestuous relationship between her and her brother she resolved to marry Polimo of uh, Cilicia but she soon left him and returned to Herod Agrippa the second Their incestuous relationship became the gossip of Rome, according to Josephus. 
But Herod Agrippa II was known to be very loyal to Rome, and uh, so that's a little background of that. So you can imagine, Paul is going to stand uh, before these people. He's going to stand before <coughs> Festus and Herod Agrippa and Bernice. She's going to sit on, in on it. Oh, boy. And I'm sure there are a lot of things that Paul could have addressed uh, because he would have been aware of the incestuous relationship between these two, and uh, he doesn't address that. Um, but let's take a look at what, um, uh, what he has to say. And uh, you remember that uh, Festus asked Paul to go to Jerusalem. Remember, they're in Caesarea on the coast. And he says, let's go back to Jerusalem for your trial. Because that's what the Jews had been asking for. What was the plan that the Jews had? And why were they saying, take him from Caesarea all the way back to Jerusalem so we can have trial for him? Why were they saying to do that? They were planning. He wasn't ever going to get there. He wasn't going to get there. They were planning an ambush and, uh, and to kill him. And so, you know, uh, and Paul said, you know, I am, I am right now um, standing trial. Look at verse 10 of 25. Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If, then, I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true, of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. And then what does he say? I appeal to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. <coughs> What does it mean, I appeal to Caesar? By the way, that was Nero. Um, what does that mean, I appeal to Caesar? That was a Roman citizen's right for an appeal. Okay. To have a judgment reviewed. All right. I want to, I want to go to the Supreme Court. This means he goes to Rome. He was going to go to Rome and appear actually before Caesar. I'm making an appeal. I wonder how many people did that. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I would kind of doubt that very many would, given the fact of how much power, almost absolute authority, the Caesars had. Yes. Now you bring something up to him that is, he doesn't concede, he concedes to be uh, trivial. I think you can say, why in the world did you yeah. waste my time with this off of your head? He is appealing to Caesar, who was Nero. Yeah, and he was prone to do that. <laughs> he was prone to do that. He was a little bit crazy in the head. A little bit. <laughs> he will eventually have Paul executed. But not this time, but the same emperor will eventually have Paul executed and Peter. In, in about 68 or 69. 68. He'll have him executed in 68. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, he makes his appeal to Caesar. And so uh, what, what is stated after that? To Caesar you shall go. To Caesar you shall go. You've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. And uh, so it was decided they would sail for Italy. Chapter 27, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners. We don't know how many other prisoners that there were, but they were delivered over to a centurion. What is a centurion? 
He's a, a ruler over a hundred soldiers. He's a, a, a captain over a hundred soldiers. Um, and uh, his name was what? Trivia question here. What's his name? The last part of verse one. This will be on the test. Is it Julius? Julius. Julius. Okay. Julius. All right. And so they got on a ship, which was from Egypt, uh, about to sail to the region, regions along the coast of Asia. And remember, what? where is Asia in that time? Where was Asia? Turkey. It's in today, it's Turkey. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Scott. So Asia is this area right here. Not very big, is it? Not very big. Just this area right up here is Asia. Just that, that light green color right there. That's Asia. Remember, Paul's been to Asia. Remember, he was at Ephesus. When he was at Ephesus, you remember it says the word of God went to everyone in Asia, which is an as astonishing statement. But that's, that was what they were saying. Okay. So then anyway, this ship has uh, come from down in here, and it's going up, probably loaded with grain, heading up. It's going to go uh, over t uh, to Asia, that area. Um, and uh, so they put out to sea. And they were accompanied by Aristarchus. He was from Thessalonica. I just think it's kind of interesting to note that there were certain people from different places that Paul has gone and evangelized. Some of those people become very loyal to Paul. And sometimes they, they accompany him on his travels. I just think that's very interesting. And here's a guy from Thessalonica. He, and Paul, no doubt, led this guy to the Lord, and now he's loyal to Paul. And, yeah, I'll go with you. I'll go with you to Rome. Let me, let me come along. Now, what he's doing down there in, Mas in uh, um, not Macedon, in uh, Caesarea, I don't know. But anyway, he says, I'd like to go along. Okay. And then who else is traveling? <coughs> Luke. Luke. How do we know Luke is along? We. we. This is one of the we sections of the book of Acts. And so when you're reading through, pay attention to whether or not it says they went here, they did this, they went there, or if it says we went here, we went there. Because Luke is the author and sometimes he was in on the action, and sometimes he's not. But when he's in on the action, then uh, he'll use the, the pronoun we. So he says, uh, we, and so we've got, uh, Paul has a, at least these two companions with him that are traveling with him, uh, along with this centurion who is in charge of him as a prisoner, and a bunch of other prisoners, and we don't know how many others, or why th th those prisoners. We don't know anything about those prisoners. So um, uh, they put out to sea under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. That's verse 4. Now what that means is we are getting late in the season for traveling. S late September, October. By the time November rolls around, you didn't want to be on the Mediterranean Sea in a sailboat because the winter winds will have set in and they're not going to allow you to go where you want to go unless you want to go where they're going. Uh, so it's not, it's not going to be a, a, a good uh, trip. And so they, the shipping would stop in November you would stop shipping things, and we're getting too close. We're getting to late September right now, and and so it's 
Already the winds. Oh, must be an amber alert. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Everybody scary. got it. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the trunk. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a black car. Some people that break into churches. <laughs> no, that's not it. Okay. Well, uh, you know that uh, everybody had their phone on. <laughs> what does that tell you? No, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, what does that tell me? It tells me, uh, Jerry, why, why didn't you turn your phone down? Mine just turned off when it went on anyway. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, yeah. It goes, it it goes anyway. Yeah. Oh, does it go on anyway? Yeah, it, it overrides. All right, well, but I'm going to, I'll try to get rid of the spam while we're at it here. <laughs> yeah. Set it up here. One time I was uh, praying or singing at a funeral, I don't remember which. I was up on stage and my phone was on the front pew and started ringing. Oh no. It wasn't the one thing I could do about it. No, it was over, like way over there. It was way at over. Pleasant Valley. Yeah. 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 So you couldn't do anything. <laughs> so. I'm sure that happened to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, he's made his defense. They've set sail, but the winds are contrary, and uh, that's in verse 4. And then verse 5, when we had sailed through the sea uh, along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Ly Lycra. Okay, let's go back to the map. So, they started down here in Caesarea. Remember, they had been in Jerusalem. The Jews said, oh, go to, go to Jerusalem. <laughs> well, on the way, they were going to waylay them. All right, so he appeals to Caesar. He's in Caesarea. Goes, they sail up to Sidon and then catch another boat and go on the east side of Cyprus. And then they have gone through Cilicia, gone past that, and Pamphylia, that's in your text. And now they've come to Myra. Here they change ships. To a, a grain ship that's sailing for Italy. Okay. And, uh, but it's not good sailing weather. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. And when we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty had a ride off, off of um, Sindus, since the winds did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off uh, Simone, and with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. So let's go back to the map. And uh, so they, what they have done, they've left uh, Sandias and came on down to the island of Crete, uh, Salmoni, and then with great difficulty, they've come over here to Fair Havens, with great difficulty. Now, that's by their standards. They're, as professional sailing people, they've had a hard time of it. And uh, here at Fair Havens, this is Fair Haven, Heavens. <laughs> That's not right. It's Fair Havens. So uh, when they came there,
Paul gives them a warning. And what does he say? Let's look at verse 9. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over. What is the fast that we are talking about here? Well, this would have been uh, Yom Kippur, okay? The fast of Yom Kippur. So we are late September, early October. That's how we know our, our dating in here. Um, the fast was already over. Paul began to admonish them. Look at verse 10. And he said to them, what? Somebody read I verse perceive, 10 for me. Then I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Okay, now, uh, Paul is addressing the centurion. He is addressing the captain, and the owner of the ship, even. Now, listen, guys. Now, here's, he's a prisoner, but he's taking charge, in a sense, and saying, now listen to me. This is what I perceive is going to happen. And so they listen to him, right? <laughs> verse 11. Somebody read verse 11. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. All right. Uh, they think we can make it. All right. Now look at verse 12. Because the harbor, Fair Havens, was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix. Now let's look back at, and we'll see Phoenix. You've all, how many of you have ever been to Phoenix? <laughs> Okay, that's different. Okay, this one's over here, the far western part of Crete. And they're hoping, they're hoping just to go from here to here. Hope we can make it. And they get this gentle wind. Oh, we can do it, guys. So they put out to sea. What does it say? Verse 13. Somebody read that for me. When the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire of putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. Okay, so, hey, we've got a gentle wind. Good. So they are sailing close to the shore, and they've got this nice gentle breeze. That's, that's uh, helping them to get along. Now what happens? Yeah, trouble. What happens? Somebody read that for me. But not long after, a tempestuous head of wind arose. Or the others, I can't call it, called something. Yeah. See, did I put that in your notes? I may have or may. Yes, I. You put an aeroquito. Yes. I was if that was anything related to a mosquito. <laughs> so it's a, no. I put it in here in your notes. Um, it's a hybrid word. It's half Greek and half Latin. It means uh, east-north. It's a nor'easter wind. That's what it is. It means a treacherous east-northeast hurricane force wind. That's Ryrie and Ryrie study notes. <clears throat> the Greek word is typhoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Typhoon. So uh, that's that's what the, they've got. It drove the ship westward away from Crete. They've lost control. 
They've lost control of this ship, and it is just being blown so strongly they can't stop it, and, and things are out of control. So let's uh, look at the map again for a second. So they were trying just to, yeah, they were trying just to go from Fair Havens over to here, and they got started, but then here comes this powerful wind, and there's nothing they can do about it. So why didn't they turn on their diesel engines and turn, well, you know why. <laughs> So it blows them because this is a northeastern wind, and it's blowing them away from Crete. And they just, they're just going back and forth, and they have no control. They cannot control where they're going. Now, they are kind of headed in, in the general direction that they need to go. But uh, not in the manner they'd like to, to go. And uh, so they're, they're at the mercy. And uh, so let's see, where are we? Uh, moderate wind running down along the shelter. Uh, verse 15, and when the ship was caught in it, in that strong wind, and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. I bet that was scary. Be in a boat and there's nothing you can do. Now verse 16, running along the shelter of a small island called Colada, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. The ship's boat under control would be uh, the dinghy. The dinghy is a, like a lifeboat that they're towing behind, and it's probably filled with water from this storm, and they're having a lot of trouble getting it under control, and so they're, they hoist it up. Um, and uh, let's see what, what it says there. Verse 17, after they had hoisted it up, then they used supporting cables to, in undergirding of the ship, fearing they might run aground on the shallows of uh, Sirtis. They let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The sea anchor was just to slow down the progress, slow down their speed. And uh, so the next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. We're throwing it overboard. And on the third day, they knew the ships, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Verse 20. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assail assailing us, from then all, verse 20 says, all hope of being saved was being gradually abandoned. So they're all coming to the conclusion, we are going to die at sea. We are all going to be baptized. Baptized. It's very interesting, the word baptizo, which we translate as baptism, means to dip or to dunk, or it means to die at sea. So if you said, hmm, you know, the ship that they were on was baptized, what that meant was the ship went down and the people died. And they called that baptizo, baptism. 
It's very interesting because the picture of baptism is that we are buried with Christ. That's death. That's burial. And raised again to newness of life. Only if you were baptized in a ship, you were not raised again to newness of life. Um, but that was a common use of that. It was also used, um, uh, let's say that you wanted to dye some cloth. What are you doing today, Patty? I'm baptizing. You're baptizing? Uh, what are you doing? I'm baptizing, uh, I've got some uh, linen and I need to baptize it today. Oh, and in that conversation, everybody here would know that Patty is going to be dyeing cloth today because that was the common use of that. Now you're going to be dipping this thing in a dye and letting it set there for a while. Oh, yeah, he wants me over here. Oh. <laughs> uh, he was out of the camp. <laughs> okay, I was out of the picture. And so uh, in baptism, uh, we think of that as only a spiritual thing, but in the first century, the word was not simply used of spiritual thing, it was used of these common other things, and one of them was dying at sea. Uh, and so there was great danger. All these people think, I'm about to be baptized. I'm about to be baptized. I'm about to die at sea. That's what they would be thinking. They've lost all hope, says verse 20. We've lost all of our hope of uh, making it through this. Then comes a great, I told you. Yes, here comes the I told you so section. Verse 21. Randy, why don't you read the I told you so when section? They had gone a long time to the truth. Then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. All right, there's the I told you so. But he's not done with his little speech. And verse 22, yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will uh, turn out exactly as I've been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. Now, I want you to notice, Paul has started out as a prisoner. He would have zero clout, right? As a prisoner. You're a prisoner. Just like the other prisoners on this. He is gradually gaining some clout. He said when they were back at Fair Havens, don't set sail. If you do, it'll end in tragedy and great loss. Uh, don't pay attention to him. I told you so, but also the God whom I serve has revealed to me this is what is going to happen. And you are to take courage because none of you will lose your life. All of them at this point think we are going to lose our life. And he is saying, no, that is not what is going to happen. Okay, Paul is gaining quite a bit of clout as he comes along here, right? I mean, they're starting to listen to him. They're starting to listen to him. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why do you think that God is revealing these things to Paul? Why do you think God is affirming his messenger to these men. 
because it affirms his message. Okay. Paul has been sent to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and here he's got a boatload of them. And in order for these people to listen to Paul, Paul has, God has to affirm Paul as his messenger. I think that's a good part of the reason we're having all of this trouble. It's because God wants to elevate Paul in their eyes as the messenger from God. And so they are, um, let's see, where were we? 27. 27. Angel of God appeared to me and all that. Uh, keep up your courage. Now verse 27, but when the fourteenth night came as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea. I want to tell you what the Adriatic Sea is. Let's go back to the map. Oh, I've got it up here. It's the Mediterranean Sea east of Sicily. And uh, while we have this slide up, it says they will do some soundings, which means they're going to find out how deep the water is. And they find out it's 20 fathoms. A fathom is about six feet. So if my math serves me correctly, 20 fathoms is 120 feet, right? Nobody is agreeing with me. 15 fathoms, about 90 feet. All right, what does that mean? The water is getting shallower. Okay, we're only, we only have 90 feet. All right, that means we are approaching land. Remember, we're in a storm. They can't see much. And it's night, and they can't see much. And uh, the radar isn't working. And their sonar isn't working, OK? So they've got they're sound, making soundings and finding out, how deep is the water? Oh, it's getting shallower. Oh, we're getting close to land. Being tossed around like this. We're going to shipwreck. That's what some of these guys are saying. And uh, so at about midnight, the sailors began to surmise they were approaching land. They took soundings, found it 20 fathoms, a little further took it and found it to be 15 fathoms. Verse 29, fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. Why do they want daybreak? So we can see what's going on. I don't know if you've ever been out in the middle of nowhere at night on a cloudy night. Have you ever been at a place that is absolutely pitch black? You know, if it's not cloudy, you can see some stars and maybe the moon is shining and you can see, you know, objects around. That's nice. But if it's real cloudy and you're out in the middle of Colorado and you can't see a thing. I remember one time my wife and I uh, were traveling through there. It was cloudy. I pulled off the side of the road. I don't know why. I pulled off the side of the road, turned the lights off. Absolutely as dark as dark can get. Well, you can imagine if you're on a boat and you're doing soundings like this and you're finding out the water's getting more shallow, guys, we're going to shipwreck and we won't even be able to see when it's coming. It'll just happen. Can you imagine the fear that these guys are having? I'm getting scared already and it's not even happening. And so, oh, what are they going to do? And uh, verse 30, but as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat, you remember they had hoisted it up because the thing had filled with water and they had hoisted it up. So you can imagine, you can get a picture of that in your mind. It's got a cable on it and they've got it 
pulled it up with a cable, and now they've tied it off, and, and so on. Now they're letting that boat down. They're letting that boat down. Why? Uh, a few of these guys are saying, we'll be better off in a little tiny craft than we will in this big ship. And this sh big ship's going to hit rocks along, uh, you know, because it sits a lot deeper in the water, and it'll hit big rocks before we hit rocks. And so they're, they're thinking that way. And, uh, and uh, they're, they're kind of being sneaky about it had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. We've got to have all hands on deck. There's only one way. What's that? There's only one way that we're going to get saved. <coughs> we're going to have all these people here. How much clout does Paul have at this point? Look at verse 32. Jeff, would you read that for us? Verse 32. Oh, that would be chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 32. All right, here we go. So the soldiers uh, cut the rope that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Ah, that's what they did. The soldiers believed Paul at this point, haven't they? Centurion believed Paul. They went over there, cut the rope on that dinny, and let it go. So Paul has gained quite a bit of clout. And he has just said, if those men get away, none of us will be saved. Cut the rope, guys. <laughs> it's just interesting to me how Paul is gaining uh, um, clout here. And then verse 33, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. What does that tell you? They've been fourteen days and haven't eaten a thing. What does that tell you? It's too weak for the storm, but they think they're going to die. Yeah. They have been scared to death for two weeks. Well, I don't want a job on that boat. <laughs> Unless it's this one. Paul's on it, so I guess we'll all be saved. It's a little more than a three-hour tour. Yeah, more than a three-hour. <laughs> and they're not winding up on Gilligan's Island either. Uh, so they have... Um, uh, he is uh, encouraging them. You have been constantly watching, going without eating taking nothing, therefore I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. That's just a, an expression to say no one is going to be hurt in any way. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, he broke it and he began to eat. And all of them were encouraged and they themselves also took food. You see how God is using him to be, he is now the leader on this boat. He is, he is the one with um, the, the respect. I just think it's interesting how God has brought him around to that. How many people were on the boat? Was it half a dozen? Two dozen? 276. 276 people. 
Verse 38, when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. I want to ask you, why? Why are they, at this point, throwing the rest of the wheat? It says it will lighten the ship. Why do they want to lighten the ship? That's right. And if you're lighter, you will not displace as much water, and you will be able to get closer to the land before you, the bottom hits the sand or the rocks or whatever it's going to hit. And they want to get as close as they can. So everybody, throw the wheat overboard. So the fish had a feast. <coughs> All right, so that's what's going on with them. And, and remember, they're doing that because Paul has told them, we are going to run aground on an island. And they've been taking soundings through the night, remember? And so they know what's about to happen, right? We're getting closer to land, and we don't have any control over this thing. And so they're throwing the wheat into the sea, Verse 39, when day came, they could not right recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach. Look, there's a beach. Well, let's try our best to head for the beach. Do they make the beach? No, they don't quite make the beach. They resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could, and casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach, but, verse 41, somebody read it. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move. Oh, we've got a problem. What's the bow of a ship? Okay, that's the front part. What's the stern of a ship? That's the back of the ship. I interrupted you. Sorry, Larry. Go ahead. The bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Oh, boy. So that ship is just being battered. The front part of the ship won't move. The back part of the ship is being battered by the winds, and it's just breaking the ship up. If you're aboard that ship, what are you thinking about this time? I hope Paul's right. <laughs> I hope Paul's right, and not an air in my head is going to be lost. <laughs> Look at verse 42. Yeah, yeah. don't be pulling your hair out. <laughs> Verse 42, the soldier's plan was to do what? Kill the prisoners. So that none of them would swim away and escape. Uh-oh. That sounds like a bad idea. Verse 43, but the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks, others on various things from the ship. So it happened that they were all brought safely to land. It says those who could swim, which means a whole lot of those people could not swim. Scary. Now that would be a little scary. If you can swim, he says, jump overboard and swim to land. The rest of you, grab a broken piece of the ship. No, not the anchor. <laughs> Something that floats. 
grab it and make your way to the land. So that's what they do. And in this way, how many of them are saved? All of them. All of them. Yeah. Comment? Any of the prisoners were restrained in any way that would keep them from being able to swim as well? It doesn't say that they were restrained at all. The centurion would be the boss. And so if he said, no, don't kill them, let them swim ashore. I think uh, everybody was smart enough probably to figure out Paul's the one that knows what he's talking about. So we better follow his orders and we better just let these guys swim to shore. He's batting 1,000 up to this point. Yeah, he's batting 1,000 up to this point. And so I think it was, I, 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 and I think that th this is incredible to me that he's gone from being just the lowly prisoner with no say to the one that they're really listening to and they want to protect his life. I think that's incredible. That centurion is not just in charge of Paul. He'll be in charge of all the prisoners that are on that ship. But there's one prisoner on that ship that has the attention of everybody. So what happens then? I lost my place. Okay, we're now to chapter 28. What time is it? Oh, man. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out the island was called Malta. There's a lot of history since then on the island of Malta. It's figured into World War II, by the way. Um, uh, movies have been made about uh, Malta and its defense in World War II. Uh, Verse 2, the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. For because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. So the natives of that land have built the fire for this group of soggy sailing people and uh, the kindle to fire notice Paul is one of them that's gathering wood for the fire verse 3 but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand <laughs> what'd you say I'd have died right there. Yeah, I just, I'd have died right there. <laughs> From fright. <laughs> so, Viper latches itself. The natives are looking at that. And what do they think? He's going to die. Yeah, they think uh, undoubtedly what? This man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, Justice has not allowed him to live. So he's been bitten by this poisonous snake. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. I get the idea he just kept gathering wood. And they're looking at it. They were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. He so said, they're watching him. Every move he makes, they're watching him. After they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say, oh, he's a god. Isn't it something how you can go from the worst murderer to a god in just a few minutes. One snake. Yeah. Verse 
Verse 7. Somebody read for me, because this gets kind of interesting how God is going to work. And the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the <coughs> island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. Wasn't that something? And uh, there's this leading man on the island, and he is saying, listen, you guys, I'll put you up, and uh, I will uh, take care of your needs. And so he does that for three days, and it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with a recurrent fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. I think it's kind of interesting. The first thing Paul did was to pray. I think he prayed, Lord, do you want to heal this man through me? I, I think he's praying about that. I, I wonder, Lord, do you want me to be used to heal this man? And somehow or another, Paul got that confirmation. Yes, Paul, I want, I want to heal this man. I want to use you. And so he prayed for him, laid his hands on him, and he healed him. When that happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. Who else is watching? Everybody who has been on the boat. You know, the guy that said we shouldn't have left Fairhaven, the guy that said this is what's going to, the guy that said not a hair of your head will be lost. Did you hear what happened today? Oh, what? He healed a man. And now they're flocking to him, and people are going there sick, and they're coming away, getting healed. At that point, do you think this crowd would listen to what Paul says? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Got their attention. You got something to say? I think it's interesting that he prayed before he proceeded. But at this point, the people would start thinking he's a god if he wasn't visibly giving credit to God. So we don't hear Paul saying, the reason I didn't fall over dead is because of, of God healing me. He doesn't say that. But now, God is going to turn things around, and he's going to start a healing ministry using Paul. It's very interesting. I think there's a lot that happened that we would have to read between the lines to understand. But I think what is happening here is God has been preparing the field for seed. This is a Gentile crowd. You're in Gentile territory. You're in pagan country. These people will worship the pagan gods. And now all of a sudden, they think this guy is a god. No. Um, he's healing people, and no doubt he's doing it in the name of Jesus. And through all of that, God is preparing the ground for the gospel message. For Paul is the messenger of the gospel to the Gentiles. And now you have a group of Gentiles that have gone from looking at him as a mere slave in, who has done something wrong, a prisoner who has done something wrong, they're looking at him as a criminal, to 
to a man who represents God. It's incredible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and how it unfolds your sovereign protection and your sovereign ways of convincing people. And we are amazed that you are still doing that today and still bringing people to Jesus. And we just are thankful that we have the record here. And we pray that you will bless your word to our lives. And Lord, we pray that wherever we are and with whomever we are associating, you would use us as your personal ambassadors of the truth. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. It doesn't say that he preached the gospel. No, it doesn't. I say you probably have to read between the lines here. Because my guess is... um, I don't know. I, I just, I can't imagine him not yeah. preaching the gospel. Yeah. We have to read between the lines there. He has three days um, at that man's house. Yes, yeah. Yeah. it does. We'll pick it up right there next week, okay? <laughs>